network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Today is Thursday, January 27, 2022, coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Today, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer officially announced his retirement at the White House after serving the Supreme Court for 27 years. President Joe Biden makes it clear he is going to nominate a black woman for the first time to the nation's highest court. We'll be talking with uh, Melanie Campbell, uh, Black Women's Roundtable, about that uh, very issue. Reports say the economy has made a strong comeback during Biden's first year. Economist Dr. Julianne Malvo joins us to discuss what that means and what Biden should be saying to take credit. Y'all remember when companies and CEOs, quote, united to oppose states, state bills containing discriminatory voting measures? Well, why are those same companies now going back to funding Republicans? Journalist Judd Legum is calling them, calling them out on their silence. He'll be here to expose these companies and their CEOs who said uh, they have done, and who have said and done nothing when it comes to voting legislation. A second investigation in the death of Kendrick Johnson uh, comes up with empty. Uh, of course, he was a Georgia teen found rolled up in a gym mat. Uh, of course, the uh, sheriff has said case is closed. No charges whatsoever. Maryland is pushing to ban ghost guns. Prince George's County State's Attorney Aisha Brave Boy will explain what the ban means for these illegal weapons. A California city will require gun owners to have liability insurance. Also, the Cleveland Cavaliers promotes the NBA's first black woman as chief operating officer. And Highsville, Maryland is mourning the uh, suicide of their 44-year-old black mayor. We'll tell you uh, what happened. Folks, it is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Twenty-seven years Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer made it official with this letter he sent to President Joe Biden announcing his retirement. He lays out in here, uh, of course, uh, you, you, utilizing exactly what you're supposed to do in terms of uh, why he's, uh, that he's retiring, uh, also the timetable uh, that he has given in terms of his retirement. Uh, in that particular letter, uh, he talks about, again, his uh, role, the, the role that he has played, and again, uh, what he has been able uh, to accomplish uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, this was sent, of course, to uh, the President he said, I enormously appreciate the privilege of serving as part of the federal judicial system nearly 14 years as a court of appeals judge and nearly 28 years as a member of the Supreme Court. I have found the work challenging and meaningful. My relations with each of my colleagues have been warm and friendly throughout. I have been aware of the great honor of participating as a judge in the effort to maintain our Constitution and the rule of law today at the White House. Uh, Breyer, uh, of course, stood alongside President Joe Biden and speaking to the nation. Choosing someone to sit in the Supreme Court, I believe, is one of the most serious constitutional responsibility a president has. Our process is going to be rigorous. I will select a nominee worthy of Justice Breyer's legacy of excellence and decency. 
While I've been studying candidates' backgrounds and writings, I've made no decision except one. The person I will nominate will be someone with extraordinary qualifications, character, experience, and integrity. And that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. It's long overdue, in my view. I made that commitment during the campaign for president, and I will keep that commitment. I will fully do what I said I'd do. I will fulfill my duty to select a justice, not only with the Senate's consent, but with his advice. You've heard me say in other nomination processes that the Constitution says seek the advice and consent, with the advice as well, of the Senate. I'm going to invite senators from both parties to offer their ideas and points of view. I'll also consult with leading scholars and lawyers. And I'm fortunate to have advised me in the selection process, Vice President Kamala Harris. The people have come to accept this Constitution, and they've come to accept the importance of a rule of law. And I want to make another point to them. I want to say, look, uh, of course people don't agree, but we have a country that is based on human rights, democracy, and so forth. But I'll tell you what Lincoln thought, what Washington thought, and what people today still think. It's an experiment. It's an experiment. That's what they said. And Joanna paid each of our grandchildren a certain amount of money to memorize the Gettysburg Address. And the, the reason, the reason that, that, that what we want them to pick up there and what I want those students to pick up, if I can remember the first two lines, is that four, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought up, uh, created upon this, uh, 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 here a new country, a country that was dedicated uh, to uh, liberty and the proposition that all men are created equal conceived in liberty, those are his words, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. He meant it. And uh, we are now engaged in a great civil war to determine whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. See, those are the words I want. To see an experiment. And that's what he thought. It's an experiment. And I found some letters that George Washington wrote where he said the same thing. It's an experiment. That experiment existed then because even the liberals in Europe, you know, they're looking over here and they say it's a great idea in principle, but it'll never work. Uh, but we'll show them it does. That's what Washington thought. And that's what Lincoln thought. And that's what people still think today. And I say, well, I want you, and I'm talking to the students now. I say, I want you to pick just this up. It's an experiment that's still going on. Joining me now is Melanie Campbell, convener of the Black Women's Roundtable. Melanie, glad to have you here. Uh, President Joe Biden, when he was running, made it clear that he was going to appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court. Today, he was emphatic in stating that uh, to the nation as he stood there with Breyer. Melanie, can you hear me? Yes. I I, I didn't hear the question, but I, I said uh, President Biden was emphatic speaking before the nation that he yes. said that, about him appointing a black woman. And it was refreshing. Uh, it was refreshing to have a, someone who was a candidate make that kind of a pledge and actually follow through. It's been a long time coming, uh, at least the last, what, 12 years, or close to 12 years. Uh, I remember when we you know, made the attempt um, during the Obama administration and here we are today uh, with it actually uh, manifesting. Um, and we're ready to support the president in his efforts, but also to be ready for if there is any kind of pushback to fight as well. Um, you already see the folks running out here. You see these conservatives whining and complaining. Oh, it's a race and gender, not qualifications. Um, white men, that was the only folks who could apply for 250 years. I'm like, shut the hell up. Yes, I totally agree. <laughs> um, 233 years exact, I believe, is the number. Uh, and we've only had two black people, two black men, on that, on that, on that bench. And so uh, the reality is we know diversity does matter. And it's not about qualifications. Everyone's name that we're hearing out here publicly are exceptionally qualified, but they have not had the opportunity to even be considered 
uh, to even get an inter interview where you could see them walking uh, from the West Wing of uh, all the theater that we've never had that vision. And so I think uh, the moment that we're in with this country uh, is uh, as diverse as it is, even though there are those who are pushing back, the, the highest court in the land needs to be diverse. And having a black woman with lived experience who can bring that to that bench uh, is, is vitally important to this country really uh, finding a way to, to, to own the fact that we are a diverse nation, so that this rule of law will be uh, uh, a, a justice for all of us. Uh, obviously, conservatives still will hold a uh, 63 uh, majority uh, on uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, but considering the fact that we've had 115 Supreme Court justices in American history, 108 of them have been white men. Uh, I, it's not like uh, for all the people who are whining and complaining like we've had just in abundance. You even have some folks, I, I saw some idiot talking about, oh, how uh, uh, Biden has been nominating black female judges at a, which is at a higher percentage than the number of black female lawyers in the country, as if that's a, a big deal. So it's, it's been oh. really interesting listening to the folks, uh, mm -hmm. all the all the different ways they have jumped out complaining about uh, about a black black woman he hasn't chosen yet. Right, and the, and then in the, the idea of uh, the idea of that there should not be inclusion of all of us. And any time that we point out the fact that it, and you bring up race, and we're in this time where uh, we're at an inflection point in this country, and I know, you, Roland, I know you talk about it all the time, and, and the reality of the, the fact that you have people pushing back after that the um, Black Lives Matter movement. You think about that, you know, how, where we thought we were, and we, in, in, in hoping that this, maybe this will be the time that we really uh, own the fact that this is a diverse country own the fact that uh, uh, not all of us uh, are actually um, uh, being able to uh, live out our dreams in this nation because of the, of the issues of race uh, in this country and gender as well. So uh, I say, you know, the heck with whoever thinks, think what you want to think, but we are America and we want to see ourselves on that court just like you, anyone else does because we want those lived experiences, not just because of color, because it is about um, uh, exceptional qualifications, but it's also uh, the diversity of that lived experience that can come to that court. And yes, right now, as far as uh, the numbers of six to three, but we've I've lived long enough to know that things can change on, on a dime. So we don't know what the future holds. Only God knows that. But in this moment, we want to take this advantage of it. And we thank, uh, and thank um, uh, President Biden for keeping his word and, and not shrinking from that. Uh, absolutely. And so... Uh, we will see uh, who he will nominate. He's made it clear he will do so by the end of the month. Uh, Senator Chuck Schumer has said uh, they will move his nomination forward and confirm it in a month, matching what Republicans did with Amy Coney Barrett uh, when it was 27 days. 27 days. Being nominated to be confirmed. And I think that's a really important role in the point. And I think I saw you, I read something, you know, uh, that you said about that. And it's really important to hear him say, uh, in Black History Month, wouldn't that be beautiful? And going into Women's History Month, the following month, that we will see uh, this take place. All right. Melanie Kemp, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. All right. Going to go to my panel here, Dr. Greg Carr, Chair, uh, Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University, Reese Colbert, Colbert, Black Women's Views, and we'll be joined by uh, Roger Muhammad, of course, uh, who will be uh, hosting a uh, daily show on the Black Star Network. Uh, Greg Carr as well. Glad to have all three of you here. Greg, you uh, teach in the Howard University Law School. Uh, let's talk about this. Uh, first and foremost, um, people should really pay attention to what Breyer said. Was it a shock when he talked about and brought up the Civil War? Mm. No. No. Uh, I think Breyer, I suspect, and we talked about this yesterday, you and I were rolling offline, I want to know who got to him. Because he wasn't going nowhere. I wonder if uh, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg shook him. And I, I, one thing that's striking me when I saw him at the press conference today, I haven't seen Stephen Bryan quite some time. The last time I saw him, that interesting enough, East Street Cinema in D.C., he's aged considerably, of course, and, and, and but he's in good health. And he hadn't talked like this before, at least not in public. All right. But, um, you know, there's so much here to unpack, and I hope we spend some time on it. I mean, to me, this is really not going to be a fight fight. Uh, I think they'll get this seat. This 
it seems to me, for particularly for people who don't pay attention to a whole lot of other stuff, this might be enough to put the Democrats in the game to retain the presidency in 2024, uh, mm. when the when the when the real end game will come up. Because I suspect Clarence Thomas is going to come off that bench before 24 and 28, and then you have a chance to put Roberts back in play with a swing vote. Uh, and, and by the way, I know that Sonia Sotomayor doesn't claim any Afro background, but if you saw her mother, Selena, and know her history, then you understand that that Boricua from the Bronx, I'm not one of them Negroes that draws a hard line between people who speak Spanish and people who speak English. So uh, she'll have some coming. If you remember her confirmation, actually the Hispanic caucus in, in met, and they didn't, the Mexican-Americans didn't have a better candidate. They said it's going to be Sotomayor. And then they reached out, Naya Velasquez tells this story, to the Congressional Black Caucus. And Mel White said, look, if there's nobody black on the list, we will back Sotomayor. In other words, those kind of meetings are taking place now. Uh, finally, I, I would say this initially, uh, with Breyer leaving, that short list, Ketanji Brown-Jackson, which we probably all thought would be the one uh, nominee, uh, Leandra Kruger out there on the California Supreme Court, who, uh, you know, her, her mother's from Jamaica, father white. Uh, she's a little younger, Yale Law editor. Uh, to me, intellectually, she kind of makes, probably takes the lead in my mind. And we talked, I talked with my students last night about this. We went through this. Uh, Michelle Childs, of course, out of South Carolina. Even Stacey Abrams' sister, Leslie, has been floated. Leslie Abrams Gardner, who's down in Georgia, the first black woman on the, on the court there, federal court. Um, I would say that for me, you know, of course, there's going to be a black woman, but this is intellectual warfare. This is real intellectual warfare. And the, those white nationalists, and if you look at the nominees, I, I, well, we can talk about this maybe in another round, the number of nominees uh, Biden has pushed, the number that have been uh, appointed, uh, unprecedented except for JFK. Uh, but we need to understand that this is intellectual warfare, and this is the reason why you vote. So all people say voting don't matter, just shut up. Just shut up, because these people are playing for all the marbles. This is the window that's going to determine whether the United States goes forward in a way that we recognize. Uh, it, it has been very interesting, uh, Reese, uh, to watch uh, these folks just utterly lose their minds uh, with, with a, a black woman get on the Supreme Court. Um, there's this guy, Ilya Shapiro, who mm -hmm. um, uh, just got named to a prominent position at Georgetown. Uh, he sent out these tweets. Objectively, this was yesterday. Objectively, best pick for Biden is Sri uh, Trinvasan, who is solid, progressive, and very smart, even has identity politics benefit of being first Asian Indian American, but alas, doesn't fit into latest intersectionality hierarchy, so we'll get lesser black women, woman. Thank heaven for small favors. Then he says, because Biden said he only considered black women for SCOTUS, his nominee will always have an asterisk attached fitting that the court takes up affirmative action next term. Then, of course, he put out, is Joe Biden racist and sexist for saying his Supreme Court nominee will be a black woman? Well, let's just mm. say that did not go over too well uh, with the folks at Georgetown who heard it real quick from staff, faculty, and students today. This email went out. Dear members of the Georgetown Law community, Ilya Shapiro, who was recently hired to direct one of Georgetown Law's research institutes, posted a series of tweets on Twitter that he has since deleted. The tweets suggested that the best Supreme Court nominee could not be a black woman and their use of demeaning language are appalling. The tweets are at odds with everything we stand for at Georgetown Law and are damaging to the culture mm -hmm. of equity and inclusion that Georgetown Law is building every day. Signed by William Trainer, Dean and Executive Vice President uh, of the law school. Now, uh, and then of course, uh, uh, Shapiro, uh, rightfully uh, got hit up by some folks uh, on um, uh, social media uh, as a result of uh, his post. And this was interesting one, this one sister. Mr. Shapiro, as one of your future Georgetown colleagues, I'm curious, is your phrase lesser black woman meant to describe a particular black woman? Or do you intend lesser black woman to encompass the general set of black women under consideration for the seat? Uh, and that mm. was, uh, he goes, I apologize, I meant no offense, but it was an artful tweet. I have taken it down. No, Reese, it wasn't an inartful tweet when you say there's an <laughs> asterisk by her name. That was no asterisk by Thurgood Marshall's name. There was no asterisk by Sandra Day O'Connor's name. There's no asterisk by Sotomayor's name. So why should there be an asterisk by a black woman's name? 
Well, let me start off by saying uh, fuck you very much, uh, Ilya Shapiro. I hope he doesn't have a job. That statement was cool and all, but you hired him and you can show as hell fire him. So unless they do that, then that ain't nothing but a whole bunch of smoke up somebody's ass. And as far as this whole conversation about an asterisk, y'all have that anyway, because the reality is that these white supremacists want zero black people in these positions. And how about this? You're not going to be able to shuffle vice president so that we don't have any black woman in the Senate, and then you shuffle her to the White House, and then you're going to try to shuffle her to the SCOTUS to replace her with some miscellaneous white person? I don't think so. Keep dreaming. I don't want to just stop at the first black woman Supreme Court justice. I want another black woman, multiple black women in the Senate in 2022. I want the first, second, and third black women governors that are going to be on the ballots, or at least going for the nominations, for the Democratic nomination this midterms. Black people, I know sometimes people don't always think of a win for black women as a win for us all, but we really have an opportunity here to make history. And we've already made history with our votes. I don't hope y'all can hear me because my screen is frozen. We got we've you. already made history with our votes, but um, in turn, so that's why we're going to get the SCOTUS, but we have more voting to do to continue to make history in these midterms. We can show them better than we can tell them. So yeah, I can cuss them out, I can go in and go out, but they're going to have to get over and they're going to have to deal with it and we're going to keep... Uh, Faraji, uh, you know, it, it's so funny, uh, again, when I listen to, uh, these fools who are just older, just start ranting and raving and all this sort of stuff, and I really, I really, uh, laugh at them. Uh, I really laugh at them because they're just hilarious. Um, uh, it, it's like they're just so like, like you take a Ben Shapiro. I guess he's related to his other dude, maybe not. He goes, <laughs> "There's a reason Democrats never miss with their Scotus picks. They overtly choose wild leftists. That's the only real qualification. They wouldn't care whether Biden nominated an HLS grad who, who clerked for Breyer or Cardi B, so long as that person voted reliably left. Last I checked, the Federalist Society." picked Trump's nominees. Those are hard right picks. So stop the silliness. The reality is, a cons conservatives, they have made it clear they are not going to make the mistake of another David Souter being appointed. He, of course, was appointed by a Republican president, ended up as a liberal judge. They are like, hell no, we gonna raise up these folks to be hard right conservatives to guarantee we know how they rule when they get on that Supreme Court. So, Ben Shapiro, you can suck it. Mm. Hey, I'm with you on that one, Brother Roland. But here's the other part that I think that a lot of people may not know, which is because of the slim margin that Democrats have right now, they can actually pass Biden's nominee without a single Republican vote. Now, this is due to a 2017 rule, a rule change under Senate uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, which lowered the threshold of the filibuster from 60 votes to 51 votes for Supreme Court nominees. And so he tried to he blame Senator Harry Reid for that, but Reid actually changed it for, for, for Obama nominees and for lower courts, not for the Supreme right. Court. So that's a lie from McConnell. Go ahead. Exactly. And the other part of it is, is that McConnell was hoping that the change in any, the transition of any justice from the Supreme Court would take place in either in 23, 24, when it's, when it's guesstimated that the uh, Republicans will have uh, control of the Senate. But here's 22, and then you got this big opportunity for President Biden to get somebody in there. But the thing that gets me the most, you're talking about the way people are talking all this BS. Mitch McConnell sent a joint announce, uh, <laughs> sent a, uh, um, a letter to the president saying to the vice, uh, to President Biden, to select a nominee to fill Breyer's vacancy who has, quote, demonstrated reverence for the written text of our laws and constitution and have urged him to, quote, not to outsource this important decision to the radical left. What? Whatever. The hypocrisy is absolutely just, it's not even stunning, it's just, it's numbing because of the fact that you want somebody who demonstrated reverence for the written text of the laws and the constitution Yet your face is, your, your head is so far up the ass of Donald Trump who don't give a damn about the Constitution. You go along with a party that seems to be broken away from the whole idea of rule of law and just do whatever they need to do to win. I mean, right. this is absolute insanity. So we got to keep that. Like Dr. Carr said, this is a game. This is intellectual warfare. And the president has to step up. And I'm glad he made the commitment 
you know, we talk, we should talk about Judge Ketanji Brown as well um, as being a part of the conversation. But I'm glad he's making the commitment there. And I, I mean, at this point, why not pick a black woman? I got it on my sign. Black women judge best. So there it is. I mean, well, what else is there to say? Well, before I go to before I go to my next story, I did want to show y'all this 23 second of absolute comedy from Republican Senator Susan Collins. Y'all, listen to this. It is utterly hilarious. As you know, I felt that the timetable for the last nominee was too compressed. Um, this time, there is no need for any rush. We can take our time, have hearings, go through the process, which is a very important one. It is a lifetime appointment, after all. As you know, I felt that the timetable Susan, for the I, last... Susan, no I, I, I'm not trying to hear that. Susan, I'm, I'm not trying to hear that. Just, oh, I was against it then, yeah, but you went along with it and you still voted for whatever. Yeah. Ain't trying to hear it. Uh, bottom line, folks, is that we can now the vetting, uh, the vetting goes on. We'll see who the president picks. Of course, he says he will do so by the end of the month and then uh, just in time for his, of course, March 1st uh, speech before Congress. Going to go to a quick break. We come back talking to journalist Judd Legum. All of those companies, oh, we are standing and fighting for voting rights. What happened? Why have they gone? Why did they go quiet? And why are they now returning to writing checks to the very Republicans who are voting for voter suppression? He's going to break it down next, right here in Roland Martin on the Filters of the Black Star Network. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat, the Black Table, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Cupid, the maker of the Cupid Shuffle and the Wham Dance. What's going on? This is Tobias Trevelyan. And if you're ready, you are listening to and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. So, when Georgia was moving fast and furious in early 2021 with their voter suppression bill, all of these companies rushed out. We're going to stand with those who support voting rights. We don't want to see these things happen. We're not also, we're also, we're not going to be funding any of these people who were with those individuals on January 6th. This is the right thing to do. Oh, big letter was published and it was all of these wonderful uh, accolades and, and Ken Chenault and uh, uh, Fraser at Merck, they were, they wrote a letter and they were all people, they were praising them for rallying these companies on the side of democracy. Then a few months went by and they were like, 
Nobody's paying attention? Let's go back to funding them. Well, my next guest, uh, he actually has been paying attention. If you follow him, he has been very much involved uh, in reporting this. I retweet a lot of his stuff. Uh, Judd Legum has been uh, doing a great job, of course, uh, breaking down, sifting through all the paperwork to show you exactly who's been lying and who is now willing to go back to fund the very people who have been screwing over America. He is the uh, founder of Popular Information. He joins us now from D.C. Judd, so uh, who are the biggest liars? Who, who really uh, just pounded their chest, pat themselves on the back? How great they are, and now they're just back doling the cash out to Republicans. Well, well, unfortunately, it's a very long list. Uh, we tried to be super thorough about this. There were 111 companies who, in the spring, uh, signed that letter that, that you were referring to, and they said they were ready and willing to fight. They opposed all these state laws, because you know there were this rash of state laws, Georgia, Texas, Florida, all over the country. These were corporations that said they opposed those and they were ready to fight to protect voting rights. So really the day that was important that had just came uh, a few days ago when the Senate had a vote uh, for the, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, the Freedom to Vote Act, two bills that, that would essentially protect voting rights, make sure that states are not able to do the types of things that Georgia did, that Texas did, uh, and restrict voting in that way. Uh, so we had contacted all 111 of those companies again and said, do you, just, do you support these two bills? And only two companies came out and said that they supported the bills. It was Patagonia and a company called Richard Poor, which I believe makes loungewear. Hadn't heard of them before I did this reporting. But that's it two companies out of 111. And um, you, you were just, uh, you were posting about one company that was utterly hilarious, uh, that, that wrote a $15,000 check to the GOP. They then like, oh, no, 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 no. That was actually for the convention. And really, no, the check then went in late. And so it, it was so convoluted, I was just cracking up laughing how they, how, uh, who, who was that who, who wrote that check? Well, that was, uh, AT, that was actually PepsiCo. Uh, and what happened is, uh, and this, this involves uh, the abortion bill that was uh, passed in May uh, that's essentially uh, outlawing pretty much all abortion. Uh, so we, we looked at the companies that had donated to the Texas Republican Party, the Texas Speaker, the Texas uh, President of the Senate, uh, and PepsiCo uh, showed up on that list. Uh, they, the Texas Republican Party cashed a check from them uh, in August. They were saying, actually, we sent that check uh, in the summer of 2020, wouldn't say when. So then I asked them, well, the checks stay good that long? Because as far as I know, a corporate check lasts about 180 days at most, and then it goes invalid. They said, oh, no, yeah, we reissued the check in 2021. When did you reissue the check? They wouldn't tell me. So I think that it's a good example of how companies really don't want to be held responsible for their political activity. Uh, that was a case of abortion. And, and here's the case of, of voting rights. You know, they came out, they got a lot of press, as you noted. This was all over the place, corporations standing up, big headlines. Uh, but then when it comes down to, hey, there's going to be a vote, um, they stay quiet. It didn't always used to be this way. That's how, you know, you look back to 2006 when they did extend the Voting Rights Act. And actually, then Walmart and other corporations, same corporations that are very quiet now, were making public statements and saying, hey, uh, you need to, Republicans, Democrats, you need to, voting rights is not, shouldn't be a partisan issue. You need to get in support of this. And we don't see that anymore. Now, do we not see that? Um, you know, y y look, let's just cut to the chase. They want to hedge their bets, they know the Senate's 50 50. Uh, they don't want to be attacked. They don't want to see a uh, party that all of a sudden gets in control now uh, target their industry uh, by changing laws, changing one item in a bill. And so that's the case here. And, 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 and so th they're not going to do it. And the reason it's important to expose it because the people who are buying these pr products need to know where the companies stand. People who are giving a, giving, giving a company money need to know how their money is being used. 
Yeah, and I, and I think it doesn't make sense for the companies to generate all this positive publicity, and no one forced them to sign a letter saying that they were in support of voting rights. No one forced them to do that. They did it because they understood that people would like the fact that they're standing up for voting rights, but it's easy to sign a letter. The real test is when there's a vote, when there's a decision, when people are looking for who's behind this and who's not, what are you doing? You know, and, and as I went over in this report, these companies not only had fallen silent, but many of the companies, big companies like Facebook, like Google, many others, are supporting the senators that are filibustering these voting, these federal voting laws that could actually protect the right to vote. So it's not only that they're not standing up for the right to vote, they're really working the other way by empowering um, these, these Senate Republicans that chose to filibuster um, these two voting rights bills. Any questions for the panel for Judd? Yeah, yeah uh, Brother Roland, I got a question. Um, you know, talk to us, uh, and first, thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. But give us some insight as to why is it important for corporate America to be a part of this um, this whole this whole debate. I mean, I know that in your article you talked about the, the power of corporate America in urging President Bush to extend the Voting Rights Act back in 2005. But at this point, um, 2006. You know, put, 2006. Oh, yeah, excuse me. Thank you. But does this point does this put corporate America in a different space, in a space that they're not usually, you know, have too much expertise in? Does this put them in a space where they're just you know, just sounding off or just trying to be trendy versus really, you know, digging their feet into the grounds and, and getting their people um, involved in this fight. So why is this so important? Well, I think that in this case, you're right. It, it doesn't look like they're really committed to this. It doesn't look, it looks like they were just signing a letter and washing their hands of it. No, I, 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 no, that was, they were signing a letter to get that, get that free publicity. Get yeah, that. Exactly. Yay! They're with us. But I think that the reality is vote, we're seeing the erosion of voting rights. I mean, things are going backwards fairly quickly here, and it could get much worse uh, as time progresses. And corporations, for better or for worse, have a tremendous amount of power and sway, both for the people sitting in office, but also to help the people who might run for Senate next time or be challengers. The support of corporate America is extremely important for that. So if the corporations were to speak with one voice and get behind something, it would have a much greater chance of passing. You, know, you just have to look at what happened with infrastructure, the infrastructure bill. 100% supported by corporate America. They were putting ads on it, saying we needed to pass it. That became law. Build Back Better, which was going to provide child care support, universal pre-K, extension of the child tax credit, all sorts of stuff, climate. That was opposed by business. And obviously, it's still stalled, may never become law. And so mm -hmm. it's not the end-all, be-all, but they have a tremendous influence. And that's why I, I think there's an obligation to stand up for, you know, basic democratic principles, small-d democratic principles. Racy? Yeah, you know, President Biden met yesterday, I believe it was, with a, a group of CEOs. Did you see any overlap in the, 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 the population of CEOs at President Biden's meeting and the people who um, have been silent on voter rights or have not kept up, upheld their pledge on this? All of them, all of the ones that were there yesterday. <laughs> you know, I, I oh, actually, wow. I watched that meeting and I, I paid close attention to it. None of them are speaking out on voting rights. I thought it was interesting that they were even at that meeting and Biden was presenting them as supporting his agenda, um, which I was thinking good for him if they were. But one of the people at that meeting, uh, Mary Barra, the, the CEO of GM, actually leads an organization called the Business Roundtable, which is a corporate lobbying organization of CEOs, and they've been more aggressive than anyone in fighting against Build Back Better, fighting against 
um, you know, the, the child tax credit, all of those things, because it would pay for it in part by raising corporate taxes. So I think that there's a lot. It, it's another example. That meeting yesterday that you bring up is another example of, of really what we've been discussing this whole time, which is corporations trying to have it both ways, signing onto the letter about voting rights, presenting themselves as champions of voting rights. But then when it comes down to it, go, going quiet. And, and, and what Roland was talking about, I think, is important. They don't want to stick their necks out now because they're afraid, well, these Republicans might be in power in a couple of years. We want to maintain on their good side. But at a certain point, you need to be about something more than just the bottom line. Uh, but that's not what's happening now. Greg Carr. Uh, thank you, Roland. In, in fact, uh, Jed, first of all, thank you for your work. But, but continuing in that vein and recognizing that, and some people might call it, I don't know, pandemic profiteering, corporate Profits are exploding, certainly over the last couple of years, and that all of these companies are multinational corporations. I think we, I, I tend to think we kind of romanticize the notion of the nation state. Uh, given that their bottom line is the only thing, there's no morality in capitalism, do you think that their strategy of actively really supporting suppressing voting rights in the United States and kind of therefore ensuring a business friendly federal legislature and perhaps even presidency, do you think they're off target? in protecting their interests? Or is this, if corporate profits is the bottom line, is this actually not only a smart strategy, but certainly uh, something that we would be naive to think about otherwise? Now, I, I think I think you're generally right. You know, there's a couple of exceptions. There, there's some companies out there that, that have been speaking out, Patagonia, handful of others. But overwhelmingly, if you look at the entire Biden presidency, Trump presidency, you can go back, it's really been corporations say the most important thing is the corporate tax rate, keeping our taxes low. They'll step in when they can feel like they can get subsidies, uh, tax credits, like we saw in the um, transportation or the, the, the infrastructure bill. But when it comes down to helping ordinary people, many of whom actually are their workers, their workforce. They could really benefit from this if they would, if they think a little bit more beyond each quarter and maximize the profits of each quarter. But when it comes down to that, they're 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 fighting on the other side. So that's that's I think you know, in, in, is it a mistake uh, for them to do so? It depends on what their goals are, and I think if their goals are just maximizing profits, no, it's probably not a mistake. But unfortunately, what's happening is the country is suffering because you got erosion of voting rights, but you also have, as you mentioned, corporate profits are doing very well during the pandemic, but for working people, they're, they're seeing inflation, they're not seeing their wages keep up, you know, things aren't, as, things aren't nearly as good. Well, uh, keep up the great work. Certainly, let's, let's hold these folks accountable. Uh, again, they want our money. Uh, and, and look, we, know we should determine who we want to support as a result. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's important uh, to do so. I know they, they hate the attention that you give them, uh, but uh, it's needed. Thanks so much, Roland. All right. Thanks a bunch. All right, folks, going to go to another break. When we come back here on Roland Martin Unfiltered, right here on the Black Star Network, uh, more issues. First of all, when it comes to the election, the Department of Justice is trying to do their part. Also, a new poll out of Atlanta uh, could spell trouble for Stacey Abrams, Senator Raphael Warnock. We'll break that down as well. And we're talking about the economy. Oh, my goodness. Everybody keeps saying it's worse. It's awful. So why did we have the best one, the President Biden, the best one year, first team of president of the Congress since 1984. I thought it was so bad. Uh, it's not. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment.
We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Bill Duke. This is Diala Riddle. What's up, y'all? I'm Will Pack. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. The Department of Justice will allow state officials to use federal grant money to protect election poll workers from violence. In a letter to state officials addressing, uh, the, uh, of course, the threats to poll workers, uh, during the 2020 election, the DOJ says the, the course, uh, this, is, this is criminal justice purposes supported by the Justice Assistance Grant Program permit JAG funds to be used to deter, detect, and, pro and protect against threats of violence against election workers, administrators, officials, and others associated with the electoral process. We encourage state administ administering agencies to inform stakeholders that JAG funds may be used to prevent and respond to violent threats of this kind. In June, Attorney General Merrick Garland urged federal prosecutors to aggressively prosecute those who threaten election workers. Basically, they're talking to the crazy MAGA people. Uh, folks, uh, the Land Journal Constitution has dropped a poll today that shows, you know what? Um, they're not feeling President Joe Biden in uh, the Peach State. In fact, uh, his number is 61 percent disapproval. Um, uh, that's a high number. And also, if you want to start breaking down this particular poll, uh, what it also shows uh, is uh, as the race stands right now, in the first of all, 872 registered voters uh, were polled by the University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs between January 13th and 24th. The margin of error is 3.3%. Uh, now, again, uh, Biden's polling numbers is critically important for you to understand because of the impact it has on Stacey Abrams, who is running for governor, and also the re-election of Raphael Warnock, uh, who is running for the United States Senate. 71% uh, of Georgians believe the nation is heading down the wrong track. You go to my computer now. 62%, uh, uh, you see that, uh, first of all, 48% uh, of registered Georgia voters approve of the job performance of the governor, uh, Kemp, there as well. Now, you still got some conservatives not particularly happy uh, with what took place with him as well. Now, well, they also broke down with the polling standpoints, and then according to their polls right now, Stacey Abrams is seven points behind Kemp or even David Perdue. It's a smaller margin uh, who is opposing Kemp in the Republican primary. Uh, it's showing that uh, there are two candidates. If uh, Warnock is three points down to Herschel Walker, uh, then another candidate, Warnock, is actually up a couple of points. Uh, I want to go to my panel here. Uh, the, the, the reason this is important um, uh, the reason this is important, Reese, when you begin to look look at these polling numbers, here we are in January 2022, going into February. You're talking about um, a finite window. Uh, people may people may say, "Oh, well, you know, Abrams is different." No, there's a lot of things you got to factor in. With a, with a disapproval rating of 61 percent, uh, that goes into enthusiasm. And the reality is this: here, Republicans are pissed that they lost in 2020. They're pissed that they lost uh, both Senate seats and they're upset that Biden won. When you factor in that, you can expect the other side to be even more jacked up. So what you can't have is a depressed perspective on your side because you need your people just as motivated to, to vote. In your, in your mind, what must Democrats do to deal with these numbers that we're seeing on the state level that we're also seeing with his decreased job approval rating on the national level? Well, you know, I think the one of the biggest problems that the Democrats suffer from is, I won't even call it a messaging at this point, I will call it an information warfare. What's happening is people are being inundated with negative narratives about the Democratic Party. We have it from the media, which is all about horse race coverage, which is all about manufacturing drama. And then we are, I should say, the mainstream media. Let me be more specific. We also have social media where the Democrats are just getting flat out slaughtered. It's to the point to where most people don't even have the appetite to even just speak basic 
facts, uh, objective facts about what is happening. It's all about feeding this industry, this outrage machine that gets clicks, that gets engagement, that gets you booked on TV, that gets you books, booked on podcasts. And so what we're seeing is a, a political scenario that completely deviates from every kind of objective measurement of success. I don't know in what world Georgia is more on the right track than the than the United States as a whole. Okay, in what world is uh, Brian or uh, uh, Kemp doing a better job than Joe Biden? You know, but what's happening is we're we're really being driven so much by emotions to the point to where it's hard to make an economic argument about GDP growth, as we're going to talk about soon being the highest that it's been in 30 years. The the expectations that people have that are that the Biden Harris administration is falling short even though they're beating expectations in terms of unemployment. They've beat that. We've reached what has been called full employment faster than by years faster as well as the GDP growth. I mean, this is extraordinary growth that we're seeing and I understand that people don't feel the growth. They don't feel the the gains. And people at this point, they're taking for granted the, the situation we were in when the pandemic hit. So what they're being fed, and I'm not trying to diminish the intelligence level or I try to say that people don't know what's going on. People know what's happening in their everyday world. But I think that the that the Democrats are really, really suffering so much from just being completely outgunned on how they're getting their information out. It's not about slogans or anything like that. It's about actually educating people about what's being done. It's about pushing back forcefully the same way that you did an extensive um, segment about HBCU funding. It's about pushing back 100% of the time forcefully and getting out there and selling your message and showing people how they're benefiting. It's a shame that people didn't talk about the child tax credit until the damn thing expired. And it's not going to get renewed because Joe Manchin is against it. So they had a, a runway to really tout the tangible ways 57% of parents in this country were getting the child tax credit. They're not getting it in 2021 and uh, 2022. It's something that they can run on. So there are a number of things that spell danger. But the other thing, last thing I'll say is for the Democrats that are capitalizing off of discontent, for the Democrats that are sitting up there trying to push their own narrative, the whole party is going to go down together. OK, so if you maybe you like Stacey Abrams, but you don't like Kamala Harris or you don't like whoever fill in the blank person, she's going to go the same way that they go. So whatever that you're doing, and I'm not saying everybody fall in line because, you know, that's I'm, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is you have to understand the implications of eroding the confidence and eroding the way the perceptions of the Democratic Party on everybody around the country. So just be mindful about what you're saying, what you're perpetuating. Let's let's expand our discussions beyond one or two bills or beyond one or two right. senators. And let's have a real fact-based conversation so that maybe we can start to put a dent in some of these things that are just really being artificially driven by bad and incorrect narrative. Well, since Reese decided to jump the gun, let me go ahead and uh, read this story and bring in Julian Malvo. A new report shows the U.S. economy growing at its fastest rate last year since the 1980s. Yeah, y'all. Today, the Bureau of Economic Analysis reported the U.S. gross domestic product, the country's broadest measure of economic activity, shows the GDP expanded nearly 6% in 2021, the fastest pace since 1984. Uh, this is what President Biden said about the economic growth in the past year. Now, here's the piece right here that's, I think, part of the problem. It's a written damn statement. Ain't nobody reading this damn statement. Fine, I'll go ahead and read it. The GDP numbers for my first year show that we are finally building an American economy for the 21st century with the fastest economic growth in nearly four decades, along with the greatest year of job growth in American history. And for the first time in 20 years, our economy grew faster than China's. This is no accident. My economic strategy is creating good jobs for Americans, rebuilding our manufacturing, and strengthening our supply chains here at home to help make our companies more competitive. Today, Americans are finding better jobs with better pay and better benefits. Layoffs are near record lows. Uh, here's a piece, y'all. I'm bringing Dr. Julian Malvo, uh, uh, an economist. Uh, Doc, okay, the numbers are the numbers. Yep. You have to also sell the numbers. You don't have this kind of information, and you release a written ass statement. <laughs> Roland, well, you know the the sister who spoke earlier nailed it. This administration is horrid on messaging. 
It does not toot its own horn. It, you know, it's like this is laissez fair, but this is not laissez fair. This is news, and this is hard news. Uh, outgunning China with a diff very different circumstances, but that is hard news. Uh, almost 6% GDP growth, we've been hovering at two and three. That's hard news. But whoever does the messaging, and we talked about this um, earlier this week when we talked about the HBCUs, whoever does the messaging just doesn't do a great job at it. I don't know why. You're not going to get people excited unless you excite them. You're not just going to come out and be excited because they like you. People are doing better. Of course, it's a mixed bag, and that's the other piece of it. It's a mixed bag, but it is a bag. And the bag is that our economy is better than it was a year ago, better than it was two years ago, better than it was five years ago. Uh, here's I don't, I don't understand, Farage. I, I, I don't get it. I, I get an email every single day from the White House where they no no I don't don't do not pull that up please uh, I don't want to show the email I don't want to show the email so here's what they do I get an email every day for Raji from the White House showing people who are available to come on shows to talk today Thursday interview availability was COVID nineteen uh, I'm sorry. When those economic numbers come out, you should have the head of the SBA out. You should have the Commerce Secretary out. You should have the Treasury Secretary out. You should have your, uh, the, you should have, uh, your the lead of your White House Council uh, of uh, uh, Economic Advisors, okay? And, and again, and I'm gonna say this again because it's actually, it's kind of pissing me off. Y'all, there is a black woman who is the lead of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Mm -hmm. The last time I saw her was when she was on this show. <laughs> I don't, I, I'm telling y'all, I don't understand. It's not like she can't talk. It's not mm. like she's not telegenic. It's not like she doesn't talk in sound bites. She mm. does. And so mm. I'm sitting here going, how do you, you don't release a written statement when we get these GDP numbers, Trump was running his mouth, all his peaceful. Larry Kudlow's mm -hmm. out there. They on CNBC, Bloomberg, MSNBC, Fox News, Fox Business, talking about, man, the economy is roaring. It's going. They were lying. Right. <laughs> this, is right. Part, this is part of the deal, because I do want to show you this, because this is in the Georgia poll. Only about one third, now I'll show this. Only about one third of Georgians say their financial situation is better off than a year ago, compared with 42% who say they're worse off. You cannot convince me that 42% are worse off with the stimulus checks that were sent out, with the mm -hmm. unemployment benefits that went out, with the excess money that folks got PPP loans. I say that's and all. The child credit. That's all. Yeah, child credit. That's a factor mm -hmm. of really no yeah. one. Uh, all you hearing is it's awful. It's bad. Gas prices going up. Supply chain issues. Oh my God, inflation. Yo, the you can't have that GDP growth and then have this poll and both things are true. Faraj, you go ahead. Right. Just real quick. I mean, I think that's. I'm. 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 I'm I'm totally in agreement with you. We don't. You know, this administration. Everybody's been saying it. It doesn't toot its own horn. But I think that, that when you talk about the economy, you do have to break it down to a, a place where people can just um, kind of pick up on it. You know, when you're talking about Kraft Heinz, who's a company that produced Oscar Mayer hot dog sausages, they're talking about Capri Suns, they said their prices, they, they gave an announcement earlier this week saying that their prices are going up on consumer products and foods. I mean, people have to see it and feel it to believe it. And even, and I, and I think that's the big, that is also the big disparity as to why the conversation around econ economics in this country seems so far off. We got Dr. Malvo who understands the ebbs and flows of how the economy works and understands the history and how things go. But when you're talking about to the common black man, common black woman and trying to understand when they see gas prices, when they see supply chain issues, when they see, when they see food is going up, you gotta, you gotta help to people to create a context about this, and this is why government is so important because we don't know all of the ins and outs. 
I mean, we just we're we're operating on this level, right, of trying to get through the day in and day out. But on the level of national politics and national business, that's a whole different thing that has to be explained. And everybody needs to know how that system works to the best of their ability. And I think that is the big problem that we have these conversations like, you know, we might say a conversation about the national debt. Oh, we are trillion dollars or a billion dollars. Like, this, it's so hard to conceptualize what that actually means to people who are still fighting for a $15 minimum wage. Um, you know, when you're talking about these numbers, these numbers are flat. They're not dimensional. They're not tangible because there is no understanding of how this number affects this number that affects the pockets of Americans every day. So th I think that is part of the big issue as to why we're constantly kind of having this we're being in this vicious cycle about the eco economy. The American people don't know. We don't know what that means. You know what I'm saying? We don't know. We learn about it, but we just don't, still don't so, have a full understanding. Wait, so, so Julian, can you explain, you. Julian, can you explain again for people who are out here and, and it's, it's... Because you have folks who are saying, oh, my God, things are awful. Uh, we're going in an awful direction. Things are worse off. Okay, so best GDP since 1984. Mm -hmm. You have stock market. You have low mm -hmm. interest rates. Yep. You have the, the amount of money that was literally put in the pockets of mm -hmm. Americans. Okay, I get inflation. I get that. But when people are saying our economy is so bad, it's awful... How, what do you respond when you hear that? They watch too much Fox News. Uh, that's <laughs> because let me let, let, no, 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 hold up, hold up. Stay right there. Not just Fox News. Fox News, conservative talk radio, conservative folks on Facebook, the constant barrage of the, the um, we are failing, America's failing, China is crushing us, Putin is beating beat over the head. People cannot, I keep telling people, you can't overlook the impact in red states where all you have are six and eight conservative radio talk stations on the radio dial, and it's the echo chamber every day. Awful. We're bad. We suck. Mm -hmm. It's terrible every day. Go ahead. But the Democrats need to invest more money in telling the story. They don't do it. So you've got Fox and all those people you mentioned on one hand, and you've got the silence of the Democrats on the other. The fact is inflation is bad. Um, and the inflation story is one that Democrats need to tell also, because it's especially bad to people at the bottom. Um, right. If, if, if you have to pay 10 cents more for a hot dog rolling, you're not going to worry about it, nor will I or anybody else on this panel. But if somebody who is moderate income uh, with three kids has to pay more, it hits. Yes. So we need to talk about that. Biden has done a decent job with the child tax credit and a couple other things of paying attention to people in the middle and at the bottom, but he has not addressed them. And when he goes out running around, he needs to talk to these people about the economy. What one of the ways that, you know, rolling back in the day, and you know, I'm a seasoned sister. So back in the day, there were newspapers had economics reporters. They had consumer reporters. You ain't got none they of that. To, That's gone. No, so, so, so basically, you've got you basically you got some of these little chickies and chicos, brothers and sisters who don't know anything. Um, they have a journalism degree in good form, but they're not good at breaking this stuff down. So there's so many stories who don't get told. That don't get told. That's why you're so valuable, Roland, because you tell the stories. But so many people don't. So when we're trying to understand the economy. Most people take it down to the kitchen table. What does this mean for me? For what I'm eating? For how I'm filling up my right. tank? things like that. But when you take it up to the macro level, you have to connect the micro to the macro and say, this is why this is important. This is why it's important that Jerome Powell said he's going to wait until next month to raise the interest rate. Those We expected that he might have done it this month. That's an important statement about ca something cautionary. And for working class people who have mortgages, who have loans, this is a month for you to get your records together and try to get a lower interest rate if you can. It's a month for you to pay down some credit cards. It's a month for you to look at uh, some things regarding, um, you know, whether you should borrow or not. And again, financial literacy is at a 
zero in this country. We, in the black community, have begun through the NAA, Urban League, others, to increase the level of financial literacy, but it's not where it ought to be. And so people are still making dumb decisions that make them feel like they're worse off. Uh, before I mm. go to Greg, I, I want to quickly mm. go to Reese. Reese, you were trying to make a point after Faraji spoke. So go ahead. Yeah, because what I, one thing I wanted to point out was, you know, you made the, the, the comment about how could they be better off this year as opposed, or better off last year. In May of 2021, Brian Kemp ended the $300 of federal employment, unemployment benefits early. You had Republican governors across the country who, who rushed to end the additional assistance that was provided by the Democrats to people who were out, out, of, out of a job as a result of the pandemic. That was what Republicans did. And so this whole narrative that Trump put money in my pockets or Republicans are putting money in my pockets, no, Republicans were actually taking hundreds of dollars out of people's uh, unemployment benefits since last year. And another thing, too, the last thing I wanted to say is that, you know, I've read articles particularly articles about black folks who are um, dissatisfied. And every article I've read, the first thing I push back is on, on is I say, well, listen, this person said that they have two kids. Are they not getting the child tax credit? Because that's either 250 up to $600. I mean, yeah, $500 to $600 extra a month or $250 to $300 extra a month per kid. And you're talking about uh, the price of a cheeseburger going up. I'm not trying to diminish inflation, but... A lot of people got a lot of extra money last year. And the same people mm. that are talking about they didn't get anything, I'm like, oh, hold on, hold on. You mean to Come tell on. me $250 ain't enough for a, 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 a per kid? Was it enough to do anything? You're you're worse off? Oh, like, oh, 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 oh Reese, just, just to back, back it up, I got some fool named Ronald Lee in the chat room, Roland acting <laughs> like that stimulus was life-changing, uh, uh, life-changing punk-ass punk five bands. Fool. There are people who literally were being evicted. There are people right. who could pay for their health care. You goddamn right that check for a lot of people who were losing their homes. Now, you might be sitting your ass at home in a comfortable place, but I can tell you, it was a bunch of people in 2021 who was like, thank God for that check. Yep. Right. The check, man, yep. the check was life-transforming, Roland, for millions of black Americans. I don't know where they find these folks, um, but basically it was life transforming, especially for people who are making less than $50,000 a year, which is most Americans. You know, right. but, but see, right. we don't have a good perspective on what we earn, what we keep. This sister right. at Morton, Morton asked these children, how much do you think the average person earns? And they're coming up with six figures. One child said $800,000. Right. Said, <laughs> yeah, that means your daddy rich. That doesn't mean anything else. That means your daddy rich. But when you look at the average Amer the average black household has a median income of under 50 grand. It's about 40 and change. Mm. Uh, the average mm. white household, something like 60 grand. So we're mm. not talking about, you know, I don't know where people get these perceptions from. But this causes the kind of dissatisfaction that many are feeling. If you think that everybody's making more money than you, and you're making the median, then you mad. The median, like the median household income in America in 2020 was sixty-seven thousand five hundred and twenty-one dollars. Now, that for, for, that's that's household well, right. But it's, it's in terms of how they factor in, you know, like you know, uh, you know, what is a household, and typically it's like you know, um, uh, uh, four. But check this out. But this is, but now has another number. They call it the real U.S. per capita with 53,504. So, you know, it varies there. I, but, 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 but the reality is you still have to deal with how people perceive things to be, Greg. Because I'm going to go back to right. this Georgia poll. Um, in May, in May, in this poll, 5% of Democrats gave Biden an unfavorable view. That jumped to 21%. In May, 8% of black voters disapproved of Biden's performance. It jumped to 36% in the most recent poll. Now, why do I say that? That is an impact, George Floyd Justice Act. That's an yep. impact on the voting bills. Yep. So what the White House and what Democrats are going to have to do, they're going to have to figure out between now and August, how are you going to speak to the needs of African Americans. Greg, you said earlier that you believe the Supreme Court pick is going to be a huge deal, but there has to be another one. Now, I understand the White House is, and I've, I've actually, 
I've been made aware. I'll be very careful. I've been made aware of the uh, draft orders of the executive orders dealing with uh, police reform. Uh, but again, it's a question of you better look at these numbers because you, this is, this is going to impact Abrams, Warnock, Demings in Florida. It's going to impact the races in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. They got to stop saying, oh, we got lots of time. No, you don't. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. Greg? No, no, you don't. Roland, I mean, where to continue in this? Uh, and then again, I echo what Dr. Malvo said. This is why this, this, this platform, this network is so important. We have to we have to be smarter than we've been. Uh, John Bracy up at UMass, University of Massachusetts, always say people spend theories off of very thin margins of knowledge. So if we started <laughs> with the very basic question, what is the what is the meaning of gross domestic product? It's the right. value of goods and services provided. That's 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 very basic. What is the difference between the gross domestic product and corporate profits? The answer yeah. to that is corporate profits are damn near double the gross domestic product. Most people don't oh. have anything in the stock market. What 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 Faraji said is very important in this regard. Inflation, as Dr. Malvo said, who is the economist here, is being driven by corporate profiteers who have no incentive to stop this superheated runaway engine called the global economy. On the front page of today's Financial Times, the International Money Fund issued a report that's, that they anticipate the global economy to shrink over the next several years in terms of gross domestic product. And good news about gross domestic product means absolutely nothing to someone whose check continues to shrink because yeah. the value of their dollar doesn't move. Now, how does mm -hmm. that translate into policy making and policy? There is no party that fights for the poor. Right. The Democratic Party is not a party that fights for the poor. They are a wholly owned subsidiary of finance capital. It is in their interest to win elections. The reason they're not messaging is because they're scared to death that the people who are so alienated and disaffected by the fact that they are being crushed by global capitalism are not going to come out to the polls. And, and they so are so locked into the middle class, the middle class, the middle class. Reverend right. Dr. William Barber keeps saying exactly. the come growth on, to win is with these poor folks in this country. Go Julian ahead. mentioned earlier, folks, go to my computer. The black, the, the medium average household for black people, 45,870. So when we were talking about when those checks were being sent out. If you do the math, y'all, if your median household is $45,870 and that's you, a wife, and two to four kids, uh, you ain't sitting here, um, you know, uh, you ain't got a lot uh, to, to be playing with, especially depending upon where you live in the country. And so if you're talking about child tax credit, that stimulus check, how much was that stimulus check, Julian? The stimulus checks were, um, they ranged, um, they were in the thousands, low thousands. Right. And so the if, the, if, the, if the median average income for black people was 45870 that's $3,800 a month. That means if you got a $1,000 stimulus check in your household, that check was 30% of your household income. Come on. Don't Bro try Roland. to tell me that was a small-ass check. Then you got, Bro Roland, is that the black median income? As well, and the child's tax credit could be up to $500 for two children, and you basically had 3500 $3, you got, you know, another 500 per month. That's kicking you up again by uh, almost 20%. Greg, go. Say it again, Greg. No, no, I was gonna, is that the black median income? That's black. Or the median income? Yes. No, no, the median, okay. the median income is 67. That's everybody. Okay. That included white people. Right. Black people is $22,000 less than okay. and, the median. But that includes consistently, black consistently people. black media moderate income is about two thirds that this consistently over the past twenty some years, about two thirds that of white and that there are things you can do to, to play with it to make it even worse. It's two thirds of the total, which well, means it's an even smaller percentage if you're looking black to white. And if you look well, at but hold on, Greg, I'm gonna come I'm gonna come to you and if you go to my computer, if you look at this chart right here, you will see the impact of that recession under Obama how it dropped, it dropped 
but around 2011 to 37,500 and has Dang. been steadily going up uh it up 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 then it flat it, fl it, it, it then it was flat between 2017 in 2018 and then begin to climb back up. So people just need to understand the reality of the numbers. Greg, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, you know, again, this is where we we run the risk of, as my old advisor Theophile Obey used to say, mixing many things. Race certainly has a number in that in that schematic, but what that doesn't show is class. Right. Because the black people who have more money, the black people who have disposable income, the black people like us who are working, they, 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 we are figured in there too. So what I'm saying yeah. is there are vast numbers of black people who have nothing. Right. And and mm -hmm. they are the ones who in the locked in these red states where Finance capital, corporations have bought the politicians. Shout out, by the way, to John Roberts, because everybody, we all look at Shelby County versus Holder, but the real tipping point in terms of Supreme Court jurisprudence is 2010, Citizens United, where they took the leash off of just basically a propaganda war driven by these profiteers. Now, that having been said, they are locked in these states. Now, what does that mean and how does that translate? Well, it comes down to this. We are in, in many ways, the end game now in this country. We think of this as a country, but corporations don't think of this as anything but a parking place for the rules that drive their ability to profit. So they are going to make sure they finance politicians that don't get in their way. That's what that previous story was about. They're, they have gamed it. Now, the people who are the most disaffected, the ones Reverend Barber is talking about, in order to drive them to register to vote and to go out to the polls, you've got to have candidates that are going to fight for them. And quite frankly, the, the, the right. Democratic Party is not led by people who are going to do that because they have already conceded to the idea that you can never weaponize the poor politically. Now, once you've right. turned from that, this is what you're left with. The last defense for the poor would might you might look to it as the possibility of the rule of law. But even when you deal with a with a federal legislature, that is, by the way, in complete control of time, place, and manner of federal elections. There is no state role in that. Right. They will not even exercise that authority because they are terrified because they have allowed these states to set up basically many countries. And in those many countries, and when you talk about right-wing media, it is corporate-owned, it is driven by the billionaire class, and it depends on keeping these poor people misinformed, as Reese said. And as you can, if you can just keep that vote suppressed, you never have to worry about anything. And so the last thing I'll say is this. Those people in that Georgia poll are not wrong because many of those people don't have a mortgage because they don't own their homes. Many of those people see their, their, their money shrink, as they say, as they fill up their gas tank and the price goes up, and they don't understand because the company that sells the gas is making record profits, and it ain't got nothing to do with the gross domestic profit going up. So when they hear that, they experience cognitive dissonance because they, right. they have to be taught by the Julian Malvos and those of the world to understand that GDP don't mean a damn thing to your pocket unless you connect it to corporate profits, unless you connect right. it to inflation, right. unless you walk through how this is a superheated global economy with local consequences. And if you want to change it with policy, there are only two options. You've got to put people in elective office that are going to fight back against it, and that is a slim to none chance as long as we don't punch through and help people understand why getting in the process is important and tell these political parties to stop electing people who are going to sit on the fence. And then, if all else fails, You've got to have those who will enforce the rule of law in a way to protect you. And when they put that sister on the Supreme Court shortly, the reason why I said this is intellectual warfare and we have to get past just the demographic look is because whoever they put on the Supreme Court that might interpret the law differently is going to be writing dissents uh -huh. for the foreseeable future. But that becomes important when the dissent becomes the opinion that is drawn on by a majority in the future to convert it into law. This is the long game that the white nationalists have been playing since the passage of the civil rights legislation of the 60s, and I'm quite certain that we are at an inflection point in this country now where the corporations are going to make more money, the GPA, the, the GDP may okay. continue to Come go on, up, Doc. 
But the Come vast on. majority of people who suffer in this country, like the vast majority who suffer all around the world, are yeah. on the precipice of going into a permanent underclass. And we've got to be smarter than we've been and stop talking about these local polls and politics as if we're discussing something local when, in fact, we're talking about local implications of a global economy. We've just got to be smarter oh, than that. This is why, I, Julian, if, if we are when we're talking about okay, how, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with the numbers? How do you deal with this here? I have said this for a very long time. I'm going to keep saying this. I said it directly to President Obama's face and his advisors. Stop going to suburban Ohio or suburban Virginia and touting your Affordable Care Act. I yes. said you need to go to the brokest, Come on, brother. Yep. sickest, reddest mm -hmm. parts of the country, look them in the eye and say, I passed that law for y'all because y'all ass are the brokest, sickest people in the state. Come on. I totally understand. I totally understand the strategy of the White House when it comes to COVID. But you cannot, President Biden and Vice President Harris, be held hostage in D.C., that's they right. can be holding, they can be holding COVID safe town halls. They can oh, yeah. be going to these places and saying point blank. And and I'm, I'm and again, I'm going with what my man Joe Madison says, you gotta put it where the goats can get it. You got <laughs> to say, how many of y'all got that check? And that check, your governor cut off those unemployment benefits. I That's wanted right. to keep funding that, but your governor cut that money off. Why did your U.S. senators vote against uh, my That's act right. that gave you more money? Why did your U.S. See, they've got... you got to engage in that level of warfare because, again, all they're getting is what they're hearing on conservative talk radio, Fox That's News, right. and on Facebook. And so that's where they have to be. They're sitting here. You're, you're not going to win this war running a whole bunch of damn TV ads uh, just talking about the economy <laughs> or sending out these level of press releases. Reese talks about it all the time. Damn it, get your meme game up. I done said to Jamie Harrison, y'all need to go hire the damn Lincoln Project to make some damn ads for y'all because they show sure move a hell of a lot faster than y'all do when it comes to doing it. <laughs> you can... Why do Democrats want to play nice? Why do Democrats always want to play nice? I don't. And Republicans come on, always come on. Want to play nice? I don't. I don't understand it. And I'm gonna tell you right now. Uh, Peter Roussel uh, was deputy press secretary to uh, Vice President George H. W. Bush, uh, and Peter was an adjunct professor at Texas A&M. And this is what he told me. He said, "Roland," he said, um, "always pat yourself on the back." He said, you know why? Because ain't no guarantee somebody else gonna pat you on the back. If you don't tell your story, somebody mm -hmm. else is going to tell your story, and it may not be the way you want it to be. So, so the economic numbers and the political reality, those two things actually go hand in hand. And so uh, we'll see how this thing, this, this thing here uh, unfolds, uh, and, we'll, and we'll do that. Uh, and so, uh, Dr. Julia Malvo, we appreciate it. Thank you so very much uh, for joining us, uh, breaking down these numbers. We appreciate it. All right, y'all, uh, going to pay, uh, pay some bills here. Uh, and when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about the banning of ghost guns in Maryland. Uh, and we'll talk about some other news as well. Folks, don't forget to download the Black Star Network app. Do so on your Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Roku TV, uh, uh, Samsung, Amazon Fire, uh, Xbox One, and Samsung Smart TV. Available on all the platforms. You can also support our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to support this show. Uh, and so Cash App is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollinsmartin.com. Rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. I'll be back in a moment.
I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. a chair take your seat the black tape with me dr greg carr here on the black star network every week we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in join the conversation only on the black star network hello everyone i'm godfrey and you're watching roland martin unfiltered and while he's doing unfiltered i'm practicing the wobble Uh, an Arizona, an Arizona family is looking for answers after 19-year-old Gregory Elliott Buckner Jr. left for work on the morning of December 20th, 2021, and has not been seen since. Gregory is six feet tall. He weighs 190 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. He was wearing a black jacket, red hoodie, and dark-colored jeans the day he disappeared. Anyone with information should call the Phoenix Police Department at 602-261-8774, 602-261-8774. All right, folks, uh, a uh, bill has been introduced uh, in the uh, Maryland legislature to deal with the issue of ghost guns, ghost guns. Now, uh, this is obviously uh, significant. Uh, it's a significant, a serious problem uh, that we see uh, all across the country. Uh, and it was introduced last week by the state's attorney general. The bill would ban the sale, receipt, and transfer of unfinished parts to make ghost guns. Eventually, all ghost guns would be banned by January 2023. Uh, they are untraceable and do not have serial numbers. Prince George's County, Maryland, has seen an increase in gun crimes and the seizing of ghost guns. Joining us now is Aisha Bravevoy. Prince George's County State's Attorney. Glad to have you back on the show. So uh, how huge of a problem are these ghost guns for you? What, how, you know, in terms of in, in, in cases and things along those lines, what are we looking at? Oh, absolutely. Well, we have seen a huge rise in the use of ghost guns really over the past couple of years. Uh, prior to 2000 uh, to, or 2020, we really didn't see a lot of these guns uh, on our streets. Uh, but in 2020, our officers seized about 167 of those types of guns from our streets. And just last year, uh, that number almost doubled 260 uh, guns, uh, over 260 guns that are considered ghost guns were seized from the streets. So what that means is that there's an increased use in ghost guns and an increased, uh, you know, access to ghost guns. And what is so critically important about these this type of weapon is that they are not it is not regulated currently. So the sale of these guns are not regulated like other guns. So you can purchase a quote unquote ghost gun and I'll tell you a little bit about what they are in a minute, but you can purchase these guns all over the internet. And so there are people who would otherwise be prohibited people who are under the age of 18 who are prohibited uh, or really under the age of 21 in Maryland who are prohibited from purchasing the, this type of firearm, as well as individuals who might have mental health issues or who have had prior violent felonies who are otherwise prohibited from possessing a firearm can actually purchase these legally uh, from the internet because they are not regulated as other firearms are. So the legislation would, would uh, regulate these weapons and 
and place them under the same category as other firearms in our state and regulate them like other firearms. And so individuals who would be disqualified from purchasing a firearm in, in the state of Maryland would also be disqualified from purchasing ghost guns. Now, is that because uh, you've, the National Rifle Association uh, and other folks have been out here uh, limiting the ability of folks like you and state legislatures uh, to uh, uh, limit or prohibit uh, these guns? Uh, what, what, type of, what type of pushback are you getting? Because any, it, it sounds rational, but it's not that simple. Well, you would think this is a common sense bill. However, this bill has been introduced uh, at least twice before in the legislature and it hasn't gone anywhere. We have seen opposition from the NRA and other gun rights groups. But more importantly, I think we have not had the courage quite frankly, as a Democratic Party in the state of Maryland to stand up uh, for our residents, for, for the people who live in Prince George's County and all over the state of Maryland who, who want to ensure that guns are only purchased by people who are qualified to purchase them, that young people don't get their hands on guns. Let me tell you, just recently we had an unfortunate shooting at a high school in a neighboring county, Montgomery County. Um, what is being uh, reported is that the gun used in that shooting, and this was in a high school, a 17-year-old student uh, shot a 16-year-old student. What we are uh, understanding is that that gun was purchased by that 17-year-old student through the Internet, and it was purchased as a kit. So, so, so the way that the ghost guns are sold are, are, are in kits, which is what prevents them uh, from being regulated like other firearms, because when they come to your home, they are not a completed weapon. They're not operable. You actually have to put them together. So they're about 80% complete when they are sold, but you have to attach the receiver um, in order to be able to operate the weapon. And these weapons are getting in the hands of young people people, very young people who really should not be using them and have used them, unfortunately, against other young people. And so it's really important that we uh, control who gets these guns. We hold these manufacturers accountable for who they are um, selling these uh, weapons to uh, because it, again, has deadly consequences. This is not a game. These are real firearms. They have the same deadly consequences as other types of firearms. All right, then. Oh, Aisha, brave boy. We appreciate it. Thank you so very Thank much. You. Keep up the good work. And, uh, Thank you very keep, much. Keep trying to make it happen. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, folks. Let's go to California, where the San Jose City Council approved a measure requiring gun owners to have liability insurance, the first requirement of its kind in American history. The insurance would encourage gun owners to take safety classes and use gun locks. Additionally, it will cover damages or losses if the gun is accidentally used or causes harm or death. Gun owners must report if the weapon is lost or stolen to authorities. Opponents say it violates their, of course, Second Amendment rights and plan to sue the city. Gun owners will also pay a $25 fee that would go to a nonprofit that offers community resources such as firearm education and mental health services. You know, you know I get a kick, Reese, out of every time, oh, this is violated by Second Amendment. Why? Could it require you to have insurance? Um, that's not in the Constitution. <laughs> but I mean, this, I mean, it's like just it, like any, it, 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 like, like that's that, that's the, they they really think the Second Amendment just is just blanket, do whatever the hell I want to do, no consequences, no nothing. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a gun is something that can be the difference between life and death. And so these are very reasonable um, requirements. I mean, getting insurance, it actually does more to protect these gun owners than anything. So, I mean, I understand that it could be maybe a little bit cost prohibitive for some people, but then I guess you always don't get to own a gun. How about that? You know, so I, I think it's just amazing that people talk about gun violence and they talk about crime. And the first thing people want to go to is increasing police presence. No, we have to get some of these guns off the street. We have to make gun owners responsible so that their guns don't end up in uh, hands from being stolen or from being lost or whatever the situation may be. And then you also have children who um, access, you know, guns and end up killing themselves or killing their siblings or somebody else. And so this is just a very reasonable step. And it's a shame that something like this is even newsworthy. And we don't have more actions to get gun violence and guns out of under control. I'm confused here, uh, Faraji. You need liability insurance for your car, but y'all mad because they're going to require you to have liability insurance for your gun. 
I mean, I think that's an excellent law. And I mean, just I was just thinking the same thing, Brother Roland. You, if you, your, your car can be used as a weapon, as we've seen in many cases, especially what we saw in, Char in Charlottesville, I mean, your car can be a weapon. Why wouldn't you get liability insurance for your gun, which is a weapon? You know, and I, and I think that, that, that when we look at this gun situation, especially around the ghost guns, and I'm in Baltimore City, you know, it was just announced that homicides, the leading cause of death among black, young black people in Baltimore City is homicide. And, and, you know, when I was listening to Madam State's attorney, Brave Boy, she was talking about what was the bill, but in, in Baltimore City, the commissioner here, Michael Harrison, the police commissioner, said there were seven, that we're on track to recovering 700 ghost guns. Last year, they had recovered 345 ghost guns. I mean, that's double in just a single year. So when we're talking about gun ownership, when we're talking about gun use, and when we're talking about the Second Amendment, I mean, there has to be something much different there has to be a much different conversation. I mean, look, folks got to be responsible about gun ownership. If you're going to use a gun, be responsible with it. And you should go through every single hoop and fire to ensure that people who don't have guns will be protected because guess what? You know, it's the owners that's making the decision to go out into public spaces and shoot up places. It's the owner's mentality that, is, that puts us at risk. The gun is, is, is what it is. But then there's also the bigger thing. I mean, we can't, we can't just overlook the fact that America loves the culture of violence. We, we crave it. We, we just, we're, and we're just so driven by violent behavior. So just as much as we talk about dealing with the guns issue, trying to take guns off the street, you got to change the culture of violence in this country. We got to stop looking at certain films. We got to stop, you know, there are networks that are just all about violence. You know, uh, you know what? I, I, I don't, to be perfectly honest with you, I, I really don't think it's a question of, frankly, films or music. I just think at the end of the day, and I've said this, um, violence is in the DNA of America, Greg. I mean, it is, it is, it is, it is we, this country... It is you're programmed. Oh, get a yep. gun. Get a gun. Get a gun. You don't you don't even have to watch a lot of violent shows. It's get a gun. Oh, you feel unsafe? Get a gun. Oh, right. solve, solve your problem. Get a gun. And so what happens is like, like I mean, I I I've had people I've had people look at me like I was crazy when I said I've shot a gun one time in my life. At the mm -hmm. FBI Citizens Academy it was a machine gun. And I was like, this is what y'all get all excited about? <laughs> like, really? Now, let me be very clear. Let me be perfect. Now, for people who understand, I grew up in a community in Houston where the portion, the portion of my street, there were black folks who owned their homes, there were older couples, but I can look right up right here, just probably a hundred yards from our porch, where I saw the FBI, the DEA, and the Houston Police Department take down crack house. Uh, I've seen all of that. I've, so I've, I've witnessed in my neighborhood, there are people who are living in places where there is significant violence. There is rampant violence. But what I'm talking about in this country, in this country, you can be living in a suburban community and these folks act like you gotta have, uh, these folks got more damn guns and I got pairs of golf right. shoes. <laughs> and I and I got 20 pair of golf shoes, okay? And it is this whole just this mentality of gun, 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 gun. Th that's what is so pervasive in America, Greg. It is in this country's DNA, violence. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's uh well, it's a settler state. It's born in violence. There's no place to return to in the concept of the United States of America that isn't born in violence. It's interesting you say that about, you know, Raj, about films and, 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 and Roland, as you say, it's not, in, it's not in the, it's not just the films and the music, it's in the DNA. I was rereading an article on Michael Jordan from about five or six years ago, and it talked about how Jordan stays up all night watching Westerns. He and his father used to do that. And, you know, Michael Jordan played basketball the same way they shoot at each other in Westerns. 
Uh, coming mm. up for the Super Bowl, half those companies that are now supporting the white nationalists in terms of voter suppression will have ads at the Super Bowl, and ain't nobody going to turn it off because they like the violence. The whole mm -hmm. culture, as Faraji said, is violence, but it begins with settler violence. Now, how do Come we on. stop that? How do we reverse that trend? Well, we start local, go state, then federal. What we just see, what we're seeing now, you just talked to state attorney, uh, brave boy, what we're seeing in San Jose, California, are examples of local and state. But what the white nationalist party has done to cement its coming minority rule, which is in service of corporate profit and all this kind of stuff, is that in playing the long game, they have figured out that while they might not be able to stop a San Jose ordinance that, by the way, has no punitive dimension to it, while they might not have the numbers in the Maryland legislature to stop an ordinance there, although please understand that all I'd like to ask uh, State Attorney Brave Boy, while we're focusing on the black areas, PG and as far as you said, Baltimore, I wonder how many of those uh, online purchases are going into rural Maryland, into Come the on. homes of people preparing for the race war. But the again, the line of last defense will be the courts. Now, what's happening in California is that while San Jose passed this, the state of California is still sufficiently peopled at the legislative le uh, area and uh, level and with the governor to perhaps look over at Texas, as Gavin Newsom has said, and say, well, if the Supreme Court is going to let these white nurses in Texas basically turn uh, everybody in Texas into a deputy policing a woman's womb, I'm going to pass legislation in California to turn everybody in California a dep into a deputy policing guns which means now mm -hmm. you've triggered the federal issue, the Second Amendment that you bring, which brings it all back to the courts. There's no country called United States of America. There is a bunch of fighting going on and people trying to command power over other people through the courts, through the legislatures, and by the time we look up and try to do something about it, they may have already gamed this system in a way that will, quite frankly, make all of us go out and get guns. Uh, it is, uh, again, where we are. Folks, I do want to uh, get to this story here. A Georgia sheriff has concluded there was no evidence of foul play in the 2013 death of a Georgia teenager whose body was found inside a rolled-up gym mat at his high school. Uh, Lowndes County Sheriff Ashley Park spent nearly a year reviewing the death of 17-year-old Kendrick Johnson after obtaining the Department of Justice's extensive file on the case. However, Johnson's family says they don't believe the report and they don't care how long it takes. They will keep fighting for justice. More and more each day, we have students reaching out to us, speaking to us. They are grown now. They are starting to talk. And we have, if it takes 10 years, 11 years, to find out the truth, we will be steadfast in finding out the truth of what happened to Kendrick. We will prove that this sheriff's department once again lied. You, we talking about a child was murdered in their school, and they treat us like we are we are the, the ones who causes all kind of chaos and problems. Our son was murdered on their school, on their campus. State investigators uh, years ago concluded Johnson died in a freak accident and federal authorities never brought charges after closing their case in 2016. I, I am still... Um, for me, this thing is common sense. Um, Greg, Reese, and Faraj, it, it's common sense. Because what they basically said is <laughs> he had shoes at the bottom of this mat. And to get his shoes, he climbed into the mat, which meant he would have to be upside down to get his shoes, and he died. Okay, y'all, this is why I got a problem. Okay, th this is a, I got, I got a putt green here to offer, because y'all know how I play golf. Okay, I'm always putting. This is supposed to be this big old mat, okay? His shoes are at the bottom of the mat. So imagine if I stuck my hand down this, this hole right, this is a tight hole, stuck my hand down to grab something out, to get to the bottom of the mat. Or I would do this. 
Hmm. Right. Right. If I got a big old mat, my shoes in the bottom. So I'm going to climb up Mm-mm. to be upside down. Y'all hold my legs to grab my shoes or we going to tip the mat over. Hey, grab that shoe. I ain't, I'm still, I'm not buying this, Greg. Come on. Come on. Well, I mean, I, I would uh, quite frankly love to see Sheriff Polk uh, call a press conference and, and say, I'm going to show you how he did it with the assistance of uh, some help. And then we go down there and put his ass, roll his ass up in there and so how to, you know, and then maybe you are, no, 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 you're in there yourself. You can get out your. Now, that hasn't been said. This is why you have a federal government. I love what his mom said. You know, we know what side you on, Pat a roller. Klansman, we know what side you on, white boy. Let's call the feds in here and set your ass on natural fire. You went to 17, but in other words, it's time to stop talking with these people. But the problem, but the problem with the, but but here's the problem. Even if you call the feds in, if you didn't do a proper investigation on the front end, it's sort of like this this, this the sister in in Bridgeport, Connecticut. No proper investigation, no DNA taken that night didn't check his body, didn't check his clothes, didn't discover, didn't search the apartment. So even though the condom was semen in it and a pill on the table was found two weeks later, guess what? You got chain of custody issues right now. So the feds are on, can only review the available evidence that was collected. The whole issue with the videotape, okay? Uh, uh, there's so many different things here. And so what, peop- what people have to understand, the easiest way to get away with the crime, second to never being seen or leaving fingerprints, is to have the police botch it. Mm. Right. Deliberately or uh, just through screw-ups. And that, so that's the problem. The feds really are handcuffed because all you can go on is the actual evidence collected and make an assessment based upon what you've been provided. That's sort of where we are. I, I just, it just doesn't pass the common sense test for me. That, oh, I, I just, I, it just don't. I just, I, I, I don't care what, I don't care what it is. If we are, if, if, if we're sitting here, look, look, man, I, I, <laughs> I had a, I had a drone. I was flying a drone near my house. I was, I was testing it, and the drone gets caught up in a tree. So I'm standing there, looking at it. So I can either try to climb this damn tree, <laughs> or I can go to my garage, get that damn ladder. <laughs> Uh, and then grab a pole that I have, mm. boop, come down. Which one you think I'm gonna do? I'm not climbing that damn tree. I'm gonna think, <laughs> I just don't see how some shoes are at the bottom of a big ass mat and somebody said, let me go upside down to mm. get a mat and my legs are sticking up mm-hmm. and now I get trapped and now I suffocate when I could have <laughs> just tipped the mat over. I just, Faraji, go ahead. I just don't. No, I, I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around the fact that the feds aren't involved in this case. And I know you just said, unless they botched it, you know, botched up the investigation. But my thing is, what about the fact that it just doesn't make sense? Here you have a high profile national case about a black man losing his life in a very Mm. unusual, under unusual circumstances, isn't that enough to warrant an investigation from the Department of Justice to say, wait a minute, hold up, hold up, look. I know you got your 17 boxes of evidence. I know you've gone through this, but this shit don't make no sense. This just doesn't Mm -hmm. make any sense that a a young man climbs into a mat to kill himself over some damn pair of shoes. It just doesn't make sense. So, I mean, and, 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 and when you see you hear cases like this, folks, just come, 
let's come to grips with something. Racism is still prevalent in this country. Let's come to grips with the fact that in some parts of this country, that black men and black women are being killed wholesale, and then their, their, their murders are being covered up and being sanctioned by police department. That's right. And I mean, that's just, that's just what it is. Like, we got to accept that. But I mean, just the fact, and if I hope that the Johnson family keeps pushing and pushing and pushing. I mean, they got a damn documentary about this case. They've been on this show about this case. I've been hearing about this case for eight, for nine years. And you mean to tell me that the 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 the, the, the sheriff says, "Oh, it's a, it's closed. The evidence showed that there was no fire." What the? Well, but but, but, but Reese, here's the deal. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office they looked into this, and remember, right. remember, they they closed that investigation. The U.S. Attorney said. So the new one said, we're going to take a second look at it. Again, you are, you are hindered by the evidence collection in the initial investigation. Unless there is new evidence presented, uh, unless, again, which is forensic evidence, you know, the father in that clip says people are coming forward, but that's still witness testimony. Something, something has to be significant in order to be able to change uh, the course of the investigation. Risa, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to clarify for people who are asking about a federal investigation. They did a three-year federal investigation, um, the DOJ. I mean, I'm just going to read off a couple of facts about it. They interviewed 100 people. They reviewed tens of thousands of emails and text messages. They reviewed surveillance from this high school. They analyzed a lot of information. They also had an independent Department of Defense medical examiner, independent medical examiner slash forensic pathologist. So they had two of them, and they and they reviewed medical records and autopsy reports. However, this is the issue. That's not to say that he wasn't killed. That's not to say that something was not done to him. But what we have to understand, at least as it relates to the federal investigation, is they have to be able to prove a number of things beyond a reasonable doubt. And so the 17 boxes of evidence is actually from the federal investigation. And so, right. you know, it's a tragic situation. It does not make any logical sense. As you said, Roland, why wouldn't you just move the mat? Why would you turn around and... Um, and get stuck in that way. And 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 the 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 family's um, examiner had found, and this is the reason why the federal uh, Department of Justice got involved, that he died of blunt force trauma as from the neck and the jawline. And so there was evidence of something obviously violent happening to him, whether it was a violent free accident or somebody did something to him and they tried to cover it up. Something happened to Kendrick Johnson that should not have happened. And so I just, my heart really goes out to the family because I it doesn't sound like they're going to. I'm not, it sounds, I'm not saying that they would ever be at peace with it, but it doesn't sound like they're going to get the justice that they're looking for. Not necessarily because, I mean, the sheriff's department, that's a different thing, but there are other recourses, which is the federal and the federal uh, department of justice might not be able to give them what they're looking for because the proof of who did what, when, and where is not mm -hmm. there, unfortunately. And it's, 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 it breaks my heart to say that because this family is really hurting and Kendrick Johnson should be alive today, but that's the reality of the situation. Yep. So my heart just goes yep. out to the family. Uh, it is. Uh, I, 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 it, it is just, it's just, it's just strange. So. Uh, I do want to do this here. A former high school football player in Michigan accused of hazing is now suing the police department and the city for discrimination. Cleveland a Harville says the police officers only targeted black athletes during the investigation. The suit claims some of the athletes at Warren De La Salle uh, Collegiate School who were investigated lost athletic scholarships and other opportunities. Harville also says he was not a student on the or on the football team at the alleged hazing. All charges have been dropped against the athletes in the hazing investigation. So uh, we'll see what happens that. Folks, the mother of high school basketball player in California posted this disturbing video. The racist high school student shouting offensive and racial slurs at her son on Friday. Watch. Oh. Oh.
Laguna Hills high school student was yelling, chain him up, who let him out of his chains? He's a monkey, at the black athlete throughout the entire game. According to school officials, the student has been counseled and disciplined for his poor behavior. The incident took place in Orange County, which is only 2% black, and state officials say hate crimes are on the rise in the area. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand here, uh, Reese, if he did this throughout the game, uh, why didn't someone say, remove his racist ass? Because people don't actually have a problem with racism. They have a problem with racism being called out more than they have a problem with the act, the act of racial violence. And those words Come on, were Reese. racial violence. And so it does not surprise me one bit that people was just like, oh, well, I don't know. And you're going to have a lot of people that are going to sit up there and be like, oh, I didn't hear, oh, I didn't take it to be racial, you know, it, whatever the fuck the case may be. So this is just what happens. And <laughs> this is, it's actually not a revelation at all. It's very typical and behavior to be expected. It's abhorrent. And it's, it's unconscionable, but it doesn't surprise me one bit that no action was taken when it should have been done immediately. Uh, I'm just saying, Faraji, if I'm sitting in those stands and that racist is saying that, oh, the game right. the game is going to be paused. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm Ron Artest in his ass, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm running now right it's... up in the stands like, yo, what you say? Like, I mean, mm. we, you, you, we, at some point, and this is the thing about us as black people, because we have undergone so many issues and challenges as black folks in this country that I, I think to some degree, when we do hear this in modern day 2022, we are kind of numb to it. We, we, haven't, we haven't fully, you know, we, we, the, the sting of saying the nigger uh, or from, uh, from anybody, because we say it to ourselves, so our brains, and, and Dr. Carr, correct me if I'm wrong, but our brains are don't pick up the inflection or the A at the end of it. We just, oh, that's just somebody talking or I don't want to say nothing. Like, we are being conditioned to lose our humanity in the midst of savagery. And that's the part about it. Like, if somebody, if somebody calls you nigger or somebody uses, who says, calls you a monkey, that shouldn't be like, oh, that's just talk. You got to confront it. We all got to confront it in such a, 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 a strong way to send the message. Man, who the f do you think you're talking to? I'm telling you right this now. Ain't, this, ain't, this ain't 1822. This is 2022, hey, baby. We will knock you the fuck out. I'm telling you, like, I, I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now. I would have got sit, well, I, Greg, I would have went and sat right next to his ass. Say something. No question. Say something. I want, no question. Say, say it one more time and see what happens. Say it one more see, time. See, he, he, he's not going to be, he ain't going to be saying the whole game. Say it right. <laughs> Greg, Greg, final comment. Uh, no, you're right. I mean, but you know, and Faraj, you really own to something, brother. The biggest fight I ever saw at a sporting event, Tennessee State football game, and the the Alphas were sitting, no, it wasn't the Alphas, the Kappas, were sitting uh, in, in, in front of the Sigmas. And the Alpha, uh, the, the, the Kappas started singing, Green Acres is the place to be. And then you just saw this wall of blue because the Sigma's like, are we country now? And they started brawling. Amos Wilson used to say the reason that black people fight black people is because we have been socialized not to fight white people. Do you know when they would have stopped calling that young brother a name in the OC if he was playing for their team? Yep. See, what we don't mm. seem to understand is that, like you said, Faraji, the, the so-called malice in the palace, when Ron Artest is laying on that bench, on, on that right. sports table, trying to calm himself down, and then white right. boys so comfortable because they've been trained in this country that when there are no humans involved, you can roll us up in mats and kill us, and they'll let you go. They can shoot you in, in your bed, and your boyfriend shoot a gun at them. They charge him. They can Come put on. their knee on your neck, whatever. Ain't nobody going to jail. You put one white boy in jail, the rest of them, they're going to let go in a couple of weeks. Well, then you can throw a cup of beer down and hit him. But here's the problem. New York came out. And he went up in them stands, and then Steven Jackson's like, well, F that, I'm going my boy. And they beat that ass. Now, what's the <laughs> equivalent of beating that ass? Roland gonna sit there and say, now say something. You ain't gonna say nothing. But guess what? Everybody gonna watch the damn Super Bowl. You wanna know why them corporations are not going to stop funding the white nationalists? Because you ain't gonna make them stop. 
you gonna watch and they gonna pet you in the head. They gonna scream for their nigga on their team. And if he switch team, they are gonna come against him. Go ask my man and we're in Philadelphia about that. When he decided that he was gonna come back from a broken leg and damn near won a Super Bowl. And when they got mad at Terrell Owens, the N word came out. Go ask uh, Dicky Allen about that, the Philadelphia Phillies. Go ask Barry Bonds about that, San Francisco Giant. Go ask Dave oh. Parker about that when they threw batteries him in Pittsburgh. He was on their team. Ain't none of them in the Hall of Fame and ain't got a damn thing to do about performance enhancing drugs. It's got to, if you are N word, we don't tolerate racism. But once you switch teams, you are an N. Guess what? Because we all niggas, and in the words of Samuel L. Jackson in school days, y'all niggas, and you gonna be niggas forever. <laughs> well, uh, wow. Oh my I, goodness. I damn sure ah. not, but say it, try it and see what's gonna happen. <laughs> just to try to see what's gonna happen. I'm just saying. I, I I will I will say this here. I will say this here, you know. Uh you know, we all have our chance. We all have our uh our slogans. Uh we were on, we were on the Tom Jonah cruise. And normally I went normally I would go play golf when they had a beach party. Cause I, I don't give a damn about no beach party, okay? It's say on the golf course. Uh, but one of those stops, I think it was like after Hurricane, course was shut down. So I was like, damn, I got to go to the beach party. So at the, so at the end, or, so I didn't realize at the end of the beach party, they had this, they had this ritual or they had this annual deal where uh, the Omegas were staying in the middle of the, at the end of the beach, they play Atomic Dog, they'd be in a circle and they'd be chanting, barking or Arr, whatever they would do. So, um, so, uh, so, uh, Oscar Joyner was on a microphone and he was leading a chance. And so I was like, well, damn this. I, w I w went on stage and Will, Will Packer, my frat, was on stage as well. So he leading a chance. So I started chanting my damn self. And so they chanting, I'm chanting. Uh, and so then he going down uh, and they take a picture. And so we going back. Now, y'all, it's, it's about it's about a hundred of them, and it's me and Will. Uh -oh. <laughs> and I'm I'm chanting Will laughing. So it's really it's one against a hundred, which is really unfair <laughs> for the Omega. One against a hundred. That's really unfair oh. for them. So we sitting here going at it. We sitting there chanting. And so uh, I yell 06. Then the Omegas yell suck dick. I was like, oh. Then I came back with, we party all night, we stay up late, but most of all, alphas graduate. Graduate. <laughs> Nobody responded. I and I went, is 100 of y'all? Y'all ain't got no comeback? Oh. Y'all, shut them down. Now mind you, we all laugh, and this is what we do. So let me tell y'all what happened. This is a true story. <laughs> Man, we come back from the cruise. Man, if I'm slit taking a nap, my phone ring. Tom Jordan called me. Tom, mad. Hot, hot. <laughs> I'm watching the video. This is, this is, this is wrong. This is wrong. You know, my frat, y'all wrong. So I got, y'all didn't understand. I got banned from the Tom Joyner cruise. <laughs> what? <laughs> I ain't never, to, I ain't never told this story publicly. Wait, I got, what? I got banned from the Tom Joyner cruise. <laughs> now, y'all, I'm on the show. <laughs> I'm on the show four days a week. That's I got man. I got banned from the cruise because I messed up they Lil Omega moment. I started laughing. I was like, Tom, you serious? <laughs> I was like, you serious? You that hurt? Because <laughs> I cracked on your old frat brothers. I was like, yeah, all right. Come on. I wasn't phased. I mean, it wasn't like I was getting paid to be on it. But oh. it was like, yeah, and so the reason I got back on the cruise because uh, the sponsors had requested me to come back on because they were like, because <laughs> in fact, the next year, one of the, my man Ali Sadiq out of Houston was on stage and he was like, something different about the cruise this year. What is it? Where's Roland? <laughs> oh. They went to him like, say, man, can you stop bringing that up? He was like, what? I'm just saying something different. The energy is different. Roland ain't here. <laughs> Yo, that's what happened. So I get it. Some of these frats get a little sensitive with their whole deal. And so I get it. I'm just saying, graduate. All right, y'all. Uh, that's it for us. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. Faraja, Reese, uh, and Greg. Uh, y'all again uh, next week. Of course, we got uh, three, uh, got four shows launching uh, next week on Black Star Network. No, Killer Music. 
uh, queue up, uh, of course, America's Wealth Coach, Deborah Owens. Her show uh, launches. Roll it. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. And of course, uh, Faraji's show, uh, which will be a daily show, launches. Go! We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. And, of course, uh, Greg, Dr. Greg Carr will be hosting uh, his weekly show as well. Roll it. Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Now, uh, now tomorrow, I will be uh, showing you uh, the promo for Reverend Dr. Jackie Hood Martin's show, uh, Call for Field, The Art and Joy of Balanced Living. So we'll have that for you tomorrow. Don't forget. Every two weeks, we have a new episode of Rolling with Roland. Uh, the next one we're going to be dropping uh, this week is going to be my man, Bill Duke. Uh, and then that'll be followed by uh, Michelle Roberts, uh, who recently retired as the executive director of the National Basketball Players Association. And so if y'all have missed Rolling with Roland, uh, we got it ready? Y'all got Miss Rolling with Roland? Here's a sample of the interview uh, with, with the great Glenn Turman. Aretha and I met as a result of a friend of mine named Ben Vereen. She was standing in the mirror in front of, you know, the lights go around the star mirrors mm -hmm. and dressed in white and getting ready to perform. And she was standing up and she saw my reflection in the mirror and she gave a little, ah, you know, and I, I gave a little, ah. <laughs> <laughs> a mutual admiration. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. She expressed at that time that she wanted to, uh, she had moved to California and she wanted to take lessons in acting. She wanted to do some acting. And I was, like I said, I teach. Right. You know, I was, I've been teaching for 12 years, you know. And uh, so I said, well, I teach acting. And if you want, come, come down to my classes. One evening, class was very disruptive. They were all at the window. You know, I got get back here. You know, come on, we got a class. What are you doing? A limousine just pulled up. You know, a lady got out in a fur coat. <laughs> she walked into the class. And my first reaction was, you're late. <laughs> and you told the queen she was late. She was. You wouldn't let her know, I'm a teacher. I'm a, and I'm serious. And I think that's what she came to find out. Was I serious? And uh, I was. And so we became serious. Serious now when you got married. That's as serious as it gets. So I hope y'all so I hope y'all understand uh, we ain't been playing around when it comes to look of the shows, quality of the shows, all that good stuff. What you guys say, Reese? What's up? What time do these shows come on? First of all, Bree. Do you have a time? Bree. <laughs> Bree, <laughs> calm down. I was just saying, I've seen all the promos, which are fantastic. I love them. Congratulations, fellas. But I want to know what's happening coming on. Okay, calm, calm down. I'm, calm down. I'm mad if I, if I stole your thunder. Calm down. Okay, so let me explain to people how we operate. Okay. Okay. Yes, like for instance, yes, this show comes on. We're live six to eight. We restream this show multiple times in a 24 hour period. Right. So the actual time is actually not that big of a deal. But mm. more, than, more than likely, each one of the shows, each one of the weekly shows will air around 11 a.m. We've studied the metrics in terms of highest viewership 
also high point of engagement. Uh, and so we think that time is a good time for the weekly shows for people who might be going on lunch break and doing different things around that time. And so uh, even now, somebody might be saying, OK, well, what about the West Coast as well? Again, we restream the show multiple times. So people will be watching. There have been times where I've actually it's been one, two o'clock in the morning and I look up and it's 10,000 people watching live uh, at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, right. so, 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 you know, people's viewing habits are different. So, uh, the weekly shows will be in the 11 a.m. Eastern slot, but they'll still be restreamed, uh, uh, throughout, uh, throughout a 24 hour period. And remember the weekly show will be then restreamed for the whole week at mm -hmm. different times. Uh, and, and so that's, uh, that, that's what we'll be doing. So, uh, a Faraji show will be slocked into the three to 5 p.m. slot. Uh, we're towing it with it. We may do four to five fifty-five. We just, we're just still working that out in terms of when we do that. So, um, uh, so we're working through that. Uh, and so again, and then of course, eventually, once we have the twenty-four hour streaming network, you'll be able to simply turn the network on, and then it'll be streaming uh, continuously um, uh, straight up. So, uh, and then that way, so just like when you watch any any other channel. People still be able to watch it on demand, uh, but we'll be doing restreaming the show multiple occasions. So, so, so beginning next week, we'll be having five hours of original programming per day, and so mm -hmm. two two-hour shows, and then of course the weekly show, uh, and then uh, once we for the first two or three months, as we you know getting our get getting straight with these shows, then we also have uh, three to four other shows that are in development that hopefully we'll be able to launch those shows in Q3 uh, of 2022. So that's what's up. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. Yep, that's what's up. Wonderful. There. So, all right. So, Wonderful. and then people keep asking me, well, is Reese gonna, is Reese gonna get a show? Okay. That's right. Reese got, <laughs> Reese got to let me know if she want to do one and what uh -oh. she want to do. I can't, uh -oh. I can't, y'all gotta understand. Y'all can't, uh -oh. pe people have come to me, hey, I got some ideas. So, Reese got to say something. Reese? I don't act like I didn't tweet you. I said, if you want to call in show host. No, 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 no. That's a generic <laughs> concept. No, oh, you that, want me that's generic as hell. You can't. <laughs> no, that's generic. If you want to call in show. No, that's generic. You got to actually, okay, got you, you got to actually articulate a, you got to do, it's called a one pager. Hey, this is the vision. This is what I'm thinking. And then you got to say, is it, is it, uh, are you talking about a weekly show, one hour, two hours? Are you thinking about a daily show, one hour, two hours? See, you got, you got to develop the concept. I don't know your okay. schedule, okay? So weekly maybe, a daily maybe too much. Yeah, because trust me, it ain't no joke. So if it's a weekly, okay, gotcha. But so you got to develop the concept. Okay. I I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm learning. I'm learning, Rose. <laughs> oh Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. But I'm happy. Yeah. Listen, I'm I'm happy for Dr. Carr and Faraji. That is an all-star lineup. So I'm I'm excited well, for, for all of the shows coming out. Reese, so we need you. Hey, Reese, put Reese. that one page in. Stop playing. Dude. Stop playing. Reese. Get to work. Stop playing. Get to work. All right, y'all. That's it for us. Uh, again, thanks to our panel today. We appreciate it, folks. Uh, we'll see y'all tomorrow. Don't forget, download the Black Star Network app. Again, I told y'all we were not playing. All, all them haters out there who were trashing the show, y'all ain't gonna do nothing. Y'all ain't gonna survive. I told y'all I don't think about y'all. I told y'all that. And so when I when I need y'all to listen when I'm talking to y'all. I also keep telling told y'all we were building the OTT network. It was never about just me having a show. And we also, when we were asking you to support us financially, this is why. Because trust me, okay, the the pro the program development part of these four shows, and again, I told y'all I ain't got a problem being transparent. It's $20,000 a month to pay the company to, to work with all four of these hosts to develop the show, working on the promos, looking at this graphic, all that sort of stuff. That's real money. That's 20 grand outside of my show. That's to develop these four shows. And so when y'all support us with your dollars, that's what it goes to. When I'm calling out these companies who don't support us financially, I need y'all to also be retweeting that and commenting as well because they need to understand that we're serious about this here. You know, it's real interesting. I'm gonna leave you on this one here, but I'm gonna show y'all 
what priorities are. I want you to put killer music for me. I'm, this ain't gonna take long. This is gonna take 120 seconds. And I wish I could, I don't have my computers over there. But if y'all go to my Instagram page, I posted the other day about them, about the final episode of Our Kind of People. Mm -hmm. And them, them only doing 12 episodes. And I was just like, if y'all watch the show, just letting y'all know uh, that's it for the show. I posted that on my Instagram page. I want y'all to know that there have been 2,518 comments mm -hmm. about Fox only doing 12 episodes of that show. Mm -hmm. Yet... When I have posted about companies not advertising with black-owned media, mm -hmm. maybe 30 or 40. Some of y'all just missed that. Mm. 2,518 comments about a black show on Fox that we don't own. How about that? We don't own. Come on. Come on. We just own the show. 2,518 comments. So when I am talking about making sure that they are advertising with us so we can generate the revenue mm. to potentially do shows like that, mm. folk don't comment. Mm. Mm -hmm. So now you know why Fox gets the advertising and we don't. Mm-hmm. So mm. we've got to be just as willing, because trust me, if they, if one of those advertisers saw my post and saw mm -hmm. 2,518 comments, Come on. they will be calling me immediately and setting up a meeting. Wow. That's I'm bad. just saying what you, what your priorities are determine how you respond when the call is made. So I just want y'all to understand that. So, Thanks. so Thanks. I'm just, just saying, under, just think about that. 2,518 comments. Yet when I posted, I'm going to end it with this one. Yet when I posted about stars having mm. all of these black shows, Come on, building right. their right. network and not spending money with black owned media, Come on. 42 comments. Wow. 42. Damn. I'm just saying. <laughs> Folks, Black Star Network, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV, I bring the Funk Fan Club, it's Cash App, Dollar Sign, uh, RM Unfiltered, PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered, Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at uh, rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Folks, thanks a bunch. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Ha! Thank you.